And we're live. <laughs> I like to rope him in to be live every once in a while. <clears throat> and I told him, we don't have to be super serious. We can just, like, we can laugh and have fun. I think he's feeling a little bit nervous. And every time I go live, I actually do feel nervous because I, uh, yeah, it's just interesting to go live and be talking to people. So hopefully this is transmitting. I don't know because nobody's watching us right now. Maybe nobody wants to know about this. Nobody hmm. wants to know about one of the most cutting edge topics Nobody. of the year 2018. There's what? somebody. There's Katie. There's Aaron. There's right. Jessica. There's Shelly. Sure okay, people are alive and we well. All right, cool. What time is it here? I don't know. It's three o'clock in Hawaii. So I know what the problem is. Everyone's getting dinner ready. Oh. Uh, right? Dinner, I, yum, yum. Yes, everyone's getting dinner ready. I made him switch sides with me because I was like, this is my better side. I like the lighting over here. If you saw me on Instagram, I had some nice little zits over here last week because my lady friend came back for the first time after having a baby. So you all know what that's like. Anyway, awesome. we are going to talk about gut health tonight. And I pulled him on here because he's super smart, number one. And number two, he um, has read a great book called The Microbiome Solution, so he's even more knowledgeable about gut health. We're not going to talk specifically about any products or promote anything. We're just going to talk about gut health, and I'm going to share with you ladies a little something that happened to me that just reinforced to me like how important gut health is in general. So I'm going to let you talk for a little bit. Don't you want to talk about bacteria? Yeah, okay. the creatures living in us, on us, and all of that fun stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, so most of us probably have heard about the so-called microbiome, which basically is comprised of all the bacteria living both on us, on our skin, inside us, in our intestinal tract, etc. The trillions and trillions, the thought is there's hundreds of trillions of bacteria that live with us. And um, the story goes, and it's been scientifically shown that they're not just uh, along for the ride, but they are either they're helping us or potentially hurting us. And it's actually very interesting um, how that all works out. And it even starts really before we're born, you know, with our mothers and their, you know, gut health yes. <laughs> and their microbiomes uh, that exist in pregnancy. It's actually very interesting. Um, all of the new data that's coming up on these things. And it starts really in how so you were born. So does a mom's gut health matter to the baby? Absolutely. Not only okay. does it matter, but it, it matters, you know, not that you could change the way you were born, but if you had to pick, you'd rather be born vaginally and not through cesarean section, because as you might imagine, you're first exposed to um, some of your mother's uh, good gut bacteria through the birth canal, right? If anybody's ever seen a baby uh, be born, they've seen how the baby's head turns right before birth and their, their face and mouth is right up against the mom's butt. Well, that's for a reason, actually. <laughs> it's not, to, not for anything other than being exposed so to all cool, this uh, good it? bacteria that lives in the I didn't know gut. that. So, that's why their head turns. Yeah, yeah that it turns really cool. and they're, they're right there, front and center, prime time with mom's gut bacteria that's there. And so actually, you know there's a lot cool, of data though, about that. What they're yeah. doing is they so for babies that in some places that are like on top of the times, like if the baby's not born vaginally, they swab the mom and then they rub that all over the C section baby because that's mm -hmm. so important. Super important. And you can't really, I mean, it's better if you pass through the so called birth canal and baby gets to have an opportunity to have mommy's gut bacteria. But you bacteria. didn't really get to choose that when you were yeah, born. Yeah, get, so. get close and, and personal because it's important, but actually there's <laughs> lots of data on the health of uh, you know, uh, babies born vaginally versus cesarean. And, and basically those born vaginally tend to have um, the populations of the good bacteria in higher numbers than those that are born through C-section who tend to have you know the worse or, or bad bacteria that tend to be the opportunists that tend to be the ones that are in the hospitals, things like staph that like to cause infections and the, the skin bacteria that aren't good for you, they tend to have, the C-section babies tend to have in higher amounts than, than the good bacteria on them. And, and that's for an obvious reason. They weren't exposed to mom's uh, 
microbiome as they uh, pass through the birth canal and close to the butt. <laughs> so there's actually a lot of a lot of cool data on that. You know, not not just simple stuff like survival rates are higher in, in uh, vaginal birth and cesarean sections, but not just in the first year of life, but throughout one's lifetime. And you know, it all starts early, early on. So it's super, super, super interesting. Um, one one study that I read that I found almost uh, I don't want to say unbelievable, but it was something I hadn't really thought of. But even during the pregnancy process, before baby's born, um, and th this is something that I did learn in medical school, but I didn't really think too much of it. But uh, the bacteria in mom tends to change for a couple of reasons. You know, one right in the in the uh, birth canal itself and in, in the vagina, the pH changes, right, because you want to have a, an environment that's not favorable to bad bacteria, so it becomes more acidic uh, during pregnancy, and that's from certain types of uh, bacteria that are present at higher numbers during pregnancy and also in mom's gut. Uh, the pregnancy um, time has a different sort of mix of bacteria than existed before pregnancy. And they've even done experiments with laboratory animals uh, um, where they've sampled the uh, bacteria in the pregnant mouse, let's say's gut, and they've actually taken that bacteria, put it in a non-pregnant mouse, and it actually caused changes associated with pregnancy, things like increases in milk production, increases in weight in certain areas wow. of the body, hips, <laughs> breasts, things like that, without the, <laughs> without the mice even being pregnant. So not only is this something Okay, that's that, really interesting. So bacteria... It's not just hormonal. It's actually the bacteria in regulate. the gut are sending signals to the brain and signals to the body that are actually changing the environment in a mother who's actually not even pregnant, which wow. I thought was That's kind amazing. of surprising, kind of unbelievable, because we always sort of have this assumption that it's a hormonal thing, and, and some of that is true, but that's not the only thing at play, because these mice actually had the changes of pregnancy just from getting a transplant of a pregnant mouse's gut bacteria. So, that's really you know, interesting. we'll talk more about fecal transplants, because I find that fascinating. <laughs> Um, I don't ever want to be it's a recipient, but I think we could, we could be donors uh, with all the good stuff that we eat and the good probiotics so, that we like to take part of. So you're kind of talking about this. So maybe talk a little bit about what does the mi microbiome regulate? So like, what is it? What does it help to regulate, produce any of that stuff? Well, so much, so much more than we ever would have thought. And, um, you know, everything from healthy states that we'd like to you know, be able to, you know, have in our bodies versus unhealthy states, the bacteria in our gut are responsible for way more than we would have ever thought. You know, what I mean by that is, for example, um, you know, if, if you and your diet like to eat certain types of foods, say very carbohydrate rich, for example, then if you were to sample your bacteria in your colon, you'd be able to see that the bacterial numbers would favor certain types over others, and these aren't always the most um, favorable types. In other words, in the same way that I mentioned with this uh, data that's been collected on pregnancy and the changes that are associated with that that have a lot to do with the microbiome and the gut bacteria, the same sorts of things happen with just simple dietary things. For example, when you eat lots of carbohydrates, it favors certain bacteria in your gut that tend to produce certain signals which tell your body, hey, I want more of those things. I want more carbohydrates. I want, so, want more of those things that are not good for me. And actually, that's been scientifically studied. It actually affects your brain chemistry mm -hmm. based upon your diet, based upon these bacteria that tend to be overpopulating in certain types of diets, both good and bad. So it's very interesting. That totally makes sense to me because I used to be a carbivore, like a total carbivore. And I thought it was just because I was really active and I exercised a lot and taught a ton of fitness classes. And so I thought, oh, well, of course I crave carbs and sugars. And like you used to eat ice cream every single night, which is full of sugar. And um, it was just kind of like this vicious cycle, I guess, because I was feeding those microbes and then those microbes were sending a chemical signal to my mm -hmm. brain to eat more of that and so it was like this psych this hamster wheel I couldn't get off with my cravings so totally makes sense and you can think about it it's sort of these microbes are smart right they they want to survive just like you know we do right but they if they you know like a certain you know dietary component like carbohydrates for example and they tend to you know do well and populate and and 
get the ability to increase their fitness, which in biological terms just means to survive and reproduce. And if they are able to do that with a certain ingredient like carbohydrates, they're going to do everything they can to try to make you eat more carbohydrates. So it's, it's not it's just a living you, organism. <laughs> but it's what's inside you that's actually giving you signals as to what you want to eat. And also satiety is tied into yep. that bacteria as well. I mean, that it's means like the so feeling of fullness, like yeah. your satiety, like if you never feel full, for example, like when I used to eat mostly carbohydrates, an hour later, I would be hungry. Two hours later, I would be hungry because they don't make you feel satiated. And so you tend to eat more. And like I said, it's this vicious cycle. So you wrote down here something blueprint of you. That was, what do you mean? Yeah, so it's kind of like, you know, most of us are familiar Isn't with the term, you know, genome, so right? We all have a certain genome. We have certain genes that, that I have that are unique to me, that Brooke has that are unique to her. But actually, we also have a blueprint of our microbiome, if you will, which is the composition of the different bacteria that live with us, on us, inside us, as we talked about previously, that is genetically distinct. It's, it's basically unique to each individual. And that can actually be studied, researched. There's different organizations out there um, that actually sample and and map, if you will, your microbiome, and they can tell a lot of you things about you. You can send your poop in, basically. <laughs> if you want to poop in a container, you want to see what's and in you and in. on you, and <laughs> you can learn a lot you about can. yourself. Actually, you can via your own microbiome, yep. which is, you know, like I said, what lives on you, in you, and within you, and and that's basically it's almost like your DNA in a way because it affects so much about you, um, about your health, about your lifestyle, about your energy levels, all these things that you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we thought were only governed by genes, right? The genes that we have, and we've learned that it's much more than that. In you fact, can change, basically. They can, they can, can be mutate. changed. You can change your blueprint. You know, it's sort of like at birth, you basically have zero, you know, um, microbiome, right? Until you're exposed to mother's, you know, um, tract, if you will, or, or the outside the world. Canal? Basically, um, is that what you mean? Yeah, in utero, yeah. you don't have bacteria living in you because you're not eating anything, right? right? In utero, you're, you're not eating food. You're not, you know, eating anything that way. If you ever were exposed to anything in utero, it's more likely to be an infection that mom had, and that would be a whole different yeah. deal. But from birth to the first three years of life is when your microbiome sort of matures, if you will, and that's based upon the environment that you're in, the things that you eat. Um, whether or not you're on antibiotics, hopefully you're not, because they mess up your microbiome quite a bit. We can talk about that more later. But, but by the time you're about three years old, your microbiome matures to a level where you have a certain diversity, if you will. And, and diversity just means different types of bacteria that live in you, on you, within you. And you want it to be diverse. You don't want to have a preponderance of one strain or another because they can sort of take over, if you will, and, and exert what they would like to do to increase their fitness, like I talked about before, and overpopulate. And so you do want to have a diverse um, bacteria. And, and what's interesting when we look at that is like in cultures that aren't ever exposed to things like antibiotics, like let's take, you know, a rural tribe in the Amazon. If we were to sample their GI tract and compare it to, say, mine, living in an industrialized nation, mm -hmm. theirs would win as far <laughs> as being, be, being healthier, if you will. And that's not just Move based to the upon Amazon. Yeah, not just based upon whether or not I've ever been on antibiotics personally myself, which I try to never take, but it also depends on the foods I that I eat, right? I have a story for you about that. Because there are some foods and especially, you know, certain <clears throat> products that we might, you know, eat or drink, you know, like certain milk products that we don't think about that may have been from, you know, cows that were treated with antibiotics in their feed or they were treated with other hormones, growth hormones, all these types of things that we think that are benign because we ourselves aren't taking the antibiotics or we ourselves aren't taking the growth hormone, but not so fast. If you've eaten <laughs> what comes from these animals, you have by default been exposed to these things which are actually not good for you. It's very interesting and they mess with your diversity, they mess with your microbiome. So try to be like the people of the Amazon, right? We want to live dirty, we want to get out there in the mud, we want to you know, grow our own food. We want to play in the dirt and not be too. How often did you tell me I'm supposed to wash my hair? Not, 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 not as often. often maybe once do. a week, you know, once every two weeks, you know, whatever. I can't do that. I would be a total grease monster, guys. This is like 
right here, this is 48 hours and I'm like <laughs> dying to wash my hair, but I'm like, nope, I've got to work out first and then I can wash my hair and then I've gone like 48 hours. We don't, we, can, we don't want to be sterile because that I can messes feel, with No, our, we don't want to be sterile. Okay. You know? So anyways, going back to antibiotics. So here's my, I'm going to get a little personal here, ladies. So I don't hardly ever take antibiotics, but if you watch my feed, you saw that I got bit and attacked by a dog like three or four weeks ago, probably about four weeks ago now. He stitched me up on the table awesome. and um, it was a dirty wound. And so what did you start me on? Sip, sip, uh, clindamycin. Clindamycin. Clindamycin, which is a really strong antibiotic, but I didn't want to get an infection. And so I took that antibiotic. I didn't even take it for like the full 10 days. Yeah, I think you took it for it took maybe three, five four, or six days. Maybe five days and like, like a week later, I had a yeast infection. And I do not get yeast infections. And I was like, what's going on? Like, I didn't even, like, I didn't know didn't why. Even dawn on her. It didn't even dawn on me that I had been on an antibiotic. And Thomas is like, well, oh. you were on an antibiotic. <laughs> so, so that just like was even more proof to me that gut health is like, it's so real because just taking one dose of antibiotics gave me a yeast infection that did not go away easily. Now you all know that I had a yeast infection, which is really <laughs> Super awesome. Super awesome. I feel really cool about that. But can you tell me a little bit about we, antibiotics? Now we can know, you know, one of the one of the ways to, you know, prevent some of these ailments is to not expose ourselves to antibiotics unnecessarily. Don't get bit by a dog. And don't get bit by a dog, right? I wish we could always prevent that. But anyway, you know. Antibiotics are not benign. Last resort. <laughs> Last resort. Definitely not benign. And there's actually a lot of data now that looks at the exposure risk to antibiotics and not only developing, you know, opportunistic infections like Brooke did, a yeast infection. We all hear the horror stories of, you know, the uh, nasty gut organism called Clostridium difficile or C. diff, um, which actually has a horrendous um, infection involving the gut and a colitis that can make you deathly ill and even once you're treated you're often a carrier for months and months and months it's super super hard to eradicate and it's directly related to antibiotic use and so I'm not saying that antibiotics are evil and they're yes, the devil no I mean there's that. a time and a place for antibiotics but <laughs> we're not idiots if if at all possible you would like to avoid <laughs> antibiotics when they're not really really necessary and and it's unfortunate because I think the society yes. we live in, you know, me as a physician, I'm often exposed to people who really, really want antibiotics for a cough, a cold, a sinus infection, an earache, you know, all these things that really don't warrant antibiotics. And they don't really understand the ramifications of being on an antibiotic. They say that they as little benign and it doesn't as you know, four or five days, a week of an antibiotic can alter your microbiome, your gut bacteria for six months to a year with one course of antibiotics. Can you imagine that? You've worked all this time, you know, eating clean, adding probiotics through your foods, through whatever probiotics you take to your body and you're focused so hard on getting a healthy gut and then you take one course of antibiotics and they jack with your intestinal tract, your gut health for the next six months to a year. You know what else? That's, that's probably crazy. why but my it's true. stomach the data has shows been, it. that's probably why my stomach has been upset too. Like my stomach has been more upset. I was on the antibiotics and then I had that yeast infection and my stomach's been upset because now I'm in this like process of basically rebuilding my gut bacteria. And so this is one of the ways, like if you have to be on antibiotics, there are some things you should do. Obviously, you should try to avoid the sugary foods and a lot of carbs. You should try to eat um, foods that don't have the hormones and the chemicals and the pesticides and all that kind of stuff in it. And you should probably also take probiotics. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people have this question about, well, if I'm taking antibiotics, why would I take probiotics? It doesn't make sense. So, yeah, you might think that at, at a glance on the surface, but what you don't want to do is take them in the same swallow, right? To take a probiotic and an antibiotic in the same swallow, because that's going to negate some of the efficacy of either of those. So what you would like to do is try to separate them by at least a few hours. And um, what I tell patients is that if they have to be on, say, like a twice a day antibiotic, take it in the morning with food, in the evening with food, and then when you're ready to hit the pillow literally and go to sleep, you know, hopefully that's, you know, three, four hours after you eat dinner because you don't want to get reflux anyway, right? Reflux sucks. So the sooner you lay down to after you eat your last meal, 
the higher the incidence of reflux. And, and we'll talk about that maybe if we have time, but there's some interesting data on your gut flora when you take antacids and other uh, medications yeah. or over the counter, you know, things that alter your digestive tract pH. And it's contrary to popular belief, it's not good for you to do that. So, well, it we'll, alters we'll, the pH and certain, <laughs> certain strains of beneficial bacteria, they can't live in, like your body was created to, to have a certain pH and your stomach acid is there for a reason. Like it's protective, it, I mean, it's really. protective to your gut. And so if you alter that pH, guess what? Certain bacteria that you don't want to thrive and grow, they grow more. Yeah. They so, so if you have to take an antibiotic, separate it with the probiotic by a couple of hours. Try to take the probiotic as the last thing you take, literally before your head hits the pillow, a big glass of water. Because you're on and an it empty has stomach. Yeah. Empty stomach has an entire evening, hopefully six, eight, twelve hours until you eat your next meal for that to repopulate your gut with the good or beneficial strains of bacteria. So you can take antibiotics and probiotics, just not in the same swallow. And I would highly recommend if you ever had to be on antibiotics to please definitely take a probiotic. And even yeah. when you're not on antibiotics, probiotics are just good for you yeah. any given day, all day well, because long. Because nobody eats the perfect benefits. all the time, grows all their food organically by themselves. You can't be assured of where your stuff comes from. You're going to be under stress. I'm sure you drink coffee. I'm sure you drink alcohol. I'm sure you eat sugar and carbs. Like nobody is perfect and so i look at probiotics as being like a great insurance yeah. and all of our kids take probiotics we take probiotics so uh, some of the moms i see commenting here they're like oh my gosh i had c-sections with my first five babies i wish i had it's known okay. This. It's okay i feel bad but like <laughs> it's, it's, okay. it's okay because you can give your kids probiotics right you can be proactive and as a mom that's pregnant you can take probiotics and when you're nursing, you can take probiotics. And these are things that would be good for your babies and good for your kids, right? Absolutely, 100%. I mean, there's, there's so many benefits to having a probiotic-rich diet, you know, the so-called, you know, eat clean with the foods that, that aren't laden with growth hormone, you know, antibiotics and things like that. You want to eat clean, you know. And also live dirty, which means, you know, get your feet and, and hands in you the mud. Hand you hand sanitizer all the time, If you go to the farmer's guys. market and you get some fresh vegetables, you don't even have to worry about washing them. You don't want to scrub all the good nutrients off of them. Just and, rinse it. You know, you don't need to look picture perfect like they do at Costco. They've probably been sterilized at Costco and they may not have any nutritional value. <laughs> No offense to Costco, I shop there too, but it, it's it's smart to watch what we put in our bodies and yeah. and to have a you know microbiome you know happy diet because it, it really affects so many things in our life and we haven't even really scratched the surface in this little discussion today, but there's so right. many things that you can really you know improve upon in your life if you have a healthy microbiome not 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 just well, daily stuff that you can feel and yeah. notice but also in the prevention of a lot of ailments yeah. that exist that didn't used to exist to the degree that they do like but what? but do in so-called first world nations because we've kind of sterilized our existence with lots of antibiotics in ourselves and the animals that that we use for our foods you know and all these sorts of things and you know going back to the amazon example not only are their microbiomes more diverse and healthy than ours? But ours, um, because of you know these processed foods that we eat mm -hmm. and all the other things that we've talked about, we tend to have much higher incidence of autoimmune type diseases. You know, and heart disease, heart disease, diabetes, health. all these things yeah. as well. But think about all these things you hear about thyroid disease. You know, all these autoimmune yeah. ailments that diabetes can be an autoimmune ailment as well. Mm -hmm. Um, all these different rheumatic and rheumatoid type diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, you know, um, and then the bowel disorders, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, IBD, IBS, all these yeah. things that are inflammatory disorders exist in a much higher percentage amongst the industrialized nations that Where we use more unfortunately we, we use more. way more medications, antibiotics, and we our diet is more. not as good. It's not as natural, healthy, and clean as it should be. And so actually the incidence of a lot of these ailments is way higher in our so-called first world countries than it should be because of what yep. we do to our bodies through what we put in, both in our diet and in other substances like we talked about. So, yep. And the bacteria in your gut 
they help to make certain things, you know, like they, they're involved in the process of synthesizing some vitamins, right? Yeah, and hormones. Uh, lots, of, lots of healthy vitamins that you need, a lot of the B vitamins. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there's so many, so many things that we, we So it's not just about from. poop. Not, not just, just about poop. poop. It's about what's not in the poop, right? Yeast it's not just infections. about gas either. They, <laughs> it's not just about gas. Your, your gut However, health when you do start, does a lot for you, not just When you gas. do start a probiotic regimen or you it. do start a healthy diet, you might fart more. I'll just That's tell you okay. that when we started, <laughs> like we had Don't let that stop, stop you from farts continuing in the world. A good and it was so bad. Like, rich diet because, I would have to go to a different room or I'd be like, dude, go to a different room because <laughs> we were putting like this good stuff into our body and it our was body, changing our body's the flora. Like it was doing it was something. Changing it. So it when, was a good thing. So, <laughs> so I tell people this a lot too. I say when you start a gut health regimen, it's probably going to be six weeks to six months for things to really Absolutely. change. Absolutely. And that's like at a minimum because like he was saying, you know, if you take a course of the antibiotics, it can take six months to a year to improve your gut health. And so this is something that does not happen overnight. So it really drives me nuts when people start on a <laughs> gut health regimen and they're like, 30 days, mm -hmm. I'm not cured. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, we're talking six months here. So yeah, minimum, anyway, minimum. we gotta go get our kids. Cause they're go done with the kids. school. We'll do more another and time. And I think but... you might be falling asleep right now because we <laughs> talked about poop and yeast and bacteria. And we hope that you found that interesting, okay? Yeah, Anything absolutely. else? Yeah. All right, let's exchange some bacteria. We'll talk, we'll talk about fecal transplants mm -hmm. next time. Okay, <laughs> bye guys. Aloha.